So our speaker of the day is next, Mike Taylor. Mike um, spent 20 years in the, the RAF, joined in uh, 1950, that's the RAF. Uh, he was a navigator on Canberra's. Um, he was on exchange to Australia for two years, went back to England and uh, flew Valiance while he was there, or flew in Valiance as a navigator. He was seconded to Bomber Command and became an instructor on nuclear weapons. He's going to talk to you about nuclear weapons and the types of aircraft that he uh, flew in. Thank you. Now, those of you who can't read this at the back, I'm going to read it out. There's not much writing in this presentation. Cockcroft, Walton, and um, Rutherford split the Atom in 32 at Cavendish Laboratory. In 1938, Otto Kahn, German, created fission. At the time he created fission, to the time that Japan opted out of the war was seven years. And that is a very quick, encapsulated period when you compare it to uh, rocketry or aviation or the evolution of the, uh, of the motor car. Uh, any of those scientific elements in our lives, I would suggest are superseded by the atomic bomb. So the British decided that they'd go in for the atomic bomb in 47. The Canberra came into service in 51. Monte Bello, the first atomic explosion for us in 53. Now, probably the most important fact on here is this McMahon Act, which I'll refer to later. And that's 1954. The act that was passed through Congress to restrain any information leaving the United States uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, area for friendly countries. Um, Bur and I just need to say more than Burgess, McLean, and Philby. Fifty-five, a valiant came online the RAF. It actually flew in about 51. Uh, they lost the first two prototypes. Um, the, uh, it was 11 years between the Lancaster prototype and the Valiant. The Vulcan 1, soon after the Vulcan 1 bomber, the Vulcan 2 appeared. And obviously, uh, it doesn't say so here, but uh, about the time of the Vulcan one, the Victor one appeared. So there were, uh, ignoring the camera at the moment, the V bombers had your Vulcan one, Vulcan two, Victor one, Victor two, and preceding those was the Valiant. Thor, 59, the V force came online, and that, that V force uh, date is in fact the start of quick reaction alert start of the deterrent. The Navy came into it in 63, so we've got a lead time there of about nine years before resolution at the bottom here took over the deterrent. Blue Steel, which was the standoff bomb, you notice that the time between start and finish the Thor was only four years. What was Thor? Thor was, we'll do it in a second, uh, but it was uh, an above ground, uh, uh, not a continental, but a medium ballistic missile. <coughs> now this was the first one. This one was going out when I came in, in 1960. Uh, it was, yeah, they were 62, but they would have stored it uh, for, for a period. The 10,000 pound bomb, uh, the diameter is... Yeah. The, the, the bomb was, as you can see, five feet diameter. So the warhead was about that. This guy standing here seems to be a pretty small bloke, um, but... Uh, it filled the bomb bay of, of any of the V-bombers. It wasn't a Canberra-delivered uh, weapon in any way. And as you can see, 
for at the front anyway, it was 24 feet long. Mm. The, the Vulcan, I tried to measure up the Vulcan Bombay, it was about 66 feet inside. The nose there, if you, the old, well not old clocks, but the clocks that rotate with the brass and, and steel balls, and they've got a glass cover, well that, as soon as I saw it, I thought of that. It was a radar fused with a barometric backup. So it was supposed to be a plutonium-239 weapon, which was the same as the Nagasaki bomb. Now, the, uh, the bombs at Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki were nominally 20 kiloton, but in fact, the Hiroshima bomb, which was a 235, uranium-235 weapon, only produced 12 kilotons. And the Nagasaki, which was a 239, produced 15. The problem with Nagasaki was, as a, as a target, uh, it was reasonably hilly, so the shock waves were attenuated. I should probably mention now the fact that if you, a, a, a fission bomb, which all these are, uh, to start with anyway, uh, produces about 50% uh, um, blast, 30% heat and 20% radiation. If you're close enough, you don't worry about the radiation, I can tell you, because the heat and the blast will get you first. Um, so this guy went out in about early 60s. Now, this is a Vulcan II. Um, it originally was all white because we we're delivering from high level. Uh, obviously, you want as much reflection from the, from the weapon as, uh, when it goes off as possible. But then we went high, low, high. So they camouflaged the top. Sorry? This bomb I had nothing to do with. It was a 60 kiloton weapon. My mate across the desk, he dealt with the American weapons, but we could carry it. It's an odd looking thing. And the reason for that is a reduction in terminal velocity. I remind you of Trenchard's dictum that if you can't put your weapon on the target, then don't bother to go. So whether it's a bomb, a bullet, a missile, or whether it's search and rescue equipment, it's supposed to be where you want it. And the importance of the nuclear weapon being detonated is height. A 20 kiloton, you're looking at about 2,000 feet above height. And the reason for that is you get an, uh, an increase, a great increase in overpressure from the, from the reflection from the ground of the second wave, which uh, reinforces your primary shock wave and in fact you double the area of overpressure so you want it to be fairly accurate um, barometrically and I think the reason they, they discarded the radar was that you could interfere with it I, I never did ask because <coughs> it was only one that we had that was radar fused uh, obviously you've got contact, uh, contact fuses backing up all this now this was the one, this was the stand, this was the, the, the good one, as far as the stockpile went. Uh, it looked like a 2,000 pounder. Um, there is three feet, so it's a, mm -hmm. and, and, and the warhead virtually filled the weapon. So we're looking at the warhead around about this point. The Canberras could carry this, in fact it was the only one the Canberra could carry. You could put two into a V-bomb if you had to. Plutonium-239, nominal yield is 20 kilotons. Uh, the first time I knew that this became obsolete was a, was a, ver, uh, was, was, was a small entry in the page 37 of the West Australian, which said the red beard nuclear weapon is now out of RAF service. But when you loaded this, and you say you scrambled and went to uh, to uh, dispersal airfield, we had ours was Valley. I was on 12 Squadron. Um, the navigators loaded the gauntlet, in other words, the 239 into the weapon. It's the only one we did. Um, the gauntlet was about a gauntlet of four inches diameter is 11 kilograms of plutonium 239. If you reduce that to less than three inches, it becomes four kilograms. Now this is important because this stuff costs a lot of money and is difficult to make. You need a nuclear reactor to make 
239. You don't just go, go and make it. And that was on the end of an aluminium gauntlet. So the idea was that your plutonium was in the centre of your implosion system and the end of your gauntlet was on the curvature of the ball, which is the weapon. And it was very easy, actually. The, um, you know the plumber's devices that you guys put the two turn off the water? Well, it was exactly the same as that, except fairly short. And we carried the, the, uh, the gauntlet in a... Um, it's a bit shorter than that table, a bit less, about the same width and two rings, so you could roll it around. And You needed two to carry it, by the way. It was full of lead. Um, and you just took the top off, put the thing in, and just shoved it straight up into the into the weapon. Um, needless to say, we never practiced with real ones. It was always so they were just lead, so they weren't as heavy as as, as the plutonium. Now, when the Americans saw this, they needed friends to pick them up off the floor because they were laughing so much. Uh, this is a seven thousand pound yellow sun mark one. This one is the. Uh, 1954, we had the McMahon Act in Congress, and there was a withdrawal of information. So the British said, we want a hydrogen bomb. So what they did was to manufacture a bomb, which was uh, the same principle as the Hiroshima weapon, but it worked on a different, different way. The uranium was spread round the inside of your implosion system. There was no plutonium, and people at the back there's this four foot diameter and 21 foot long. The reason for the blunt nose is because your terminal velocity was only 700 feet per second, so you could more accurately gauge the detonation height. It was supposed to be, as I said, a megaton weapon, but they never did get there, and it was a fairly expensive weapon to, 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 to manufacture. Next, we went on to Thor. Now, I had nothing to do with this. Um, there was 20 squadrons of, of, of Thor. Uh, three, I think each of them had three, three weapons. And the trouble was that this was all above ground, so that's why it only lasted until 63 and went out of service. You're on 12-hour shifts, I would imagine, and you, each, of you, each of your missiles had to have an American with you with another key. Now, I'm, uh, I'm supposing here, it could be that the whole squadron was operated, in fact, the crew would operate the three weapons, I'm not sure. But what struck me when I found it, out about it, was the yield, 1.44 megatons. That's a fairly big wallop. The range is, is only into what Ukraine, maybe Western Western Russia. Um, your uh, accuracy is one to two miles. Not too bad. Not too bad. It's part of Trenchard's dictum. Um, I would think it was fairly expensive to to operate it to keep it serviced, but you also had a lot of crew. A lot of ground crew there. You had to pull this thing out of the, the hangar and stick it on its head. If you're at a quick reaction alert stage, you would have um, um, had it standing there, uh, liable for... for. Uh, by the way, I have to go back here. Something I missed. This one here. 63 filing dials. Now, when that came online, we were fully in a position where we could be, have 15 minutes warning and fully alerted. So going back to Thor, they would have had that standing like that. You would have had some warning that there was something going to happen. You couldn't, it wasn't time to pull it out and stick it on its head, on its, its tail rather. Yellow Sun 2, um, it was the same carcass, obviously, as Yellow Sun 1. It was a megaton weapon. It was a fusion weapon. We're now going away from a, from a fission weapon to a fusion. 
The basic difference is for a fusion weapon, you need a fission weapon. In fission, you are dispersing your energy by destroying the atoms with your neutrons. Once you've got that amount of heat going, if you introduce tritium deuteride and another neutron initiator, you then form a new substance. And in forming that new substance, you create even greater heat and energy. I was skeptical about when I saw this in a book. Um, I was skeptical that it uh, uh, really existed because the weapon I did a air crew checklist on was this guy here. Now he's nine foot, he's nine foot four and a half inches and sixteen and a half inches. I remember this bit, that, that round, and I always thought it was this long. It's obviously longer, but it's not as long as that, which is about eleven feet. So if they had that weapon, then fine. It was the 177B and C models. Sorry, it's 177B and C models, this, this guy. It makes it not a great deal of a difference here or there, but um, I just don't remember this particular weapon. Here we have the whole thing exploded. Um, keep in mind that's four foot, and that's when put together is 21 feet. So it wasn't very big, the warhead was quite small and beautifully made, absolutely magnificently made. The Americans did what the what uh, Beaver stopped in World War II when he said you can't chrome plate the rocket covers anymore on your Merlins, you know, but they, the Americans never got over that, they just made everything magnificent, all the atomic stuff was top class. And their testing of transistors and everything else, there was nothing going to fail because of this manufacture. Blue Steel, this was the biggest disaster. The, it was more danger to the air crew and the ground crew than it was to the enemy, I can tell you. I mean, you've got this hydrogen peroxide, you've got to load this thing up. Um, it had a, a 20 kiloton thing. It's supposed to be a standoff bomb, it was. As 150, if you're in the high delivery mode, you get about 150 uh, miles out of it, uh, uh, standoff. But if you went high low, which we had to, you got 25 kilometers. So you were virtually on the SAM um, line or ring around Moscow when you d delivered the weapon. When you filled it with the fuel, you had to have a fire engine standing by. I believe that when it was on QRA, your air crew had to be in the cockpit, certainly the navigators, to check the temperatures all the time. It cost an awful lot of money, and there was only two squadrons. One was 617, specially chosen, and another squadron that um, scammed to me. Blue Steel again. Uh, the, the Vulcan was, was, had uh, um, points on the wings where it could take Skybolt, but we never got the American weapon. I would think that was a matter of cost. I know the, the Skybolt was, SAC used it uh, 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 and uh, took it on board for some years. Now the Vickers Valiant, as I said, was the first <coughs> feed bomb. I was lucky when I came back from Australia. I, I joined the Photographic Reconnaissance Squadron, which only uh, had we had about ten aeroplanes, and we had a full bank of uh, uh, forty-eight inch cameras and three forty-fives at the back. And Raz Berry, who was the Battle of Britain Spitfire type chap, he was our CO. He was the guy who reckoned that head-on attacks were the best because. The Luftwaffe reckon they were winning the war and they had more to lose, so they, they left the situation first. Um, 
had engines of 10,000 pounds thrust. The leap from the Canberra to the Valiant, as far as crew was concerned, um, equaled the leap from the Valiant to the Vulcan II. This was a guy that was withdrawn from service in the early 70s because the main spars were cracking. So it was just as well it was built by Vickers who built battleships. Uh, this is the Victor, the Victor II. Um, we had a, a flight at uh, Witten with the Valiance PR, and they, they were the uh, people who, 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 who uh, developed side scan. Now, the beauty about the, the cameras, um, the PR cameras were in the UK, but the nuclear cameras, the squadrons were in Germany in the second TAF. And they delivered the Red Beard with the low altitude bombing system. I navigator, I never, never did this, fortunately, but the, never, the navigator pressed his mouse and that sustained a cycle where the, a, a, the pilot would select the speed, he'd be told to, to, to pull up and at 45 degrees the bomb doors would open automatically, a bomb would be released and then the pilot would complete the half loop and the half roll and the bomb doors would close automatically. And this weapon, the Red Beard, was I think, I'm only I'm not guessing, but I think it was thrown about a mile and a half, which took quite a while to give the crew time to get away, because they dived down again and went low level. <laughs>